A process in memory has a segment allocated for the call stack where your function's local variables will be allocated. Well, what lies above the call stack in a process? Let's write a C program to go on a little adventure to allow us to explore the space. So in this program, we're going to set up a pointer who's gonna be our hero. And your hero is going to uh, look through memory starting from main and increasing the address that it's addressing using uh, pointer arithmetic to explore this territory north of our quote unquote uh, stack frame wall, right? And so what I'd like you to try doing is setting up a file named adventure.c and its contents are gonna look like you see here on the slide. We're going to have a starting point, which is just a character which holds the ASCII character uh, for the, the point or the period and a pointer to that, which will be our hero, right? And it's gonna begin at the address of that character we allocated. And notice that because starting point is a local automatic variable that's set up inside of the main function scope, it's going to be allocated in the main functions frame on our call stack. So that means when we take the address of starting point, we know that we're starting from somewhere inside the main function, right? The next thing that you're gonna do is set up a forever while loop, right? A while one, or this is a while true loop in C. And we're gonna do something that you probably should not do. In fact, you definitely should not do this generally. You should never set up a pointer somewhere and arbitrarily look at what's around you unless you're really trying to hack something or explore a system, which is our excuse in this uh, little adventure file, right? So what we're doing is we're looking at, well, what is the character, what is the pointer that we have currently referring to? What is the, What are the contents of the address it references? Uh, so when this starts out, we did, the very first character printed to the screen is gonna be the period or the, the, the dot that is in the uh, starting point variable. And we're gonna do something on the next line which forces the output to be uh, flushed to the, the operating system's buffer such that uh, if this program crashed, which it will uh, eventually, if we hadn't completely filled up the buffer, we were still guaranteed for it to show up on our screen and see all of the output that was collected. The next line is the important one, the hero plus plus. This is the arithmetic that increases the address that's stored in our hero pointer to be one higher than it was before, one higher than it was before. And this is what's stepping us up, up and up further into our memory that we're trying to explore. So we print a character out, we move on. We print a character out, we move on. Go ahead and try reproducing this file and running it in the way that you see here. So you compile it and name the output object or the output binary adventure. And you can run that with dot slash adventure, wildlings and giants and homage to Game of Thrones, right? And I would encourage you to pause this, reflect on what you're seeing, and then we'll come back and talk about what is going on in this address space that is above the call stack in memory. Did you see anything interesting? Did you see the words adventure, wildlings, and giants? Hopefully you saw a segmentation fault, uh, which means that you've read somewhere outside of uh, a segment that you're allowed to read uh, from your operating system's virtual memory space that it gave to our process, right? And so once we seg fault or segment segmentation fault, that crashes the program and allows us to look at what's going on here and, and reflect on it a little bit. Right. Again, I want to point out, as this bubble indicates, this is doing something you really shouldn't be doing uh, unless you're trying to hack a system or explore a, a system like we are. So vim adventure.c, just to prove to you that uh, we're work, I've got the same code that you do here. Uh, and sure enough, we we're going to just go ahead and compile this and run it. All right, so dot slash adventure, oops, dot slash adventure, and wildlings, giants, and I might go ahead and add foo, bar, and baz as options. And wow, we've got a lot of output here. Uh, we see at the very end, notice the last thing printed is the seg fault. So uh, we have explored outside of, of bounds. We've fallen out of our world, right? We've gone off the edge of the world. And here's the command that we ran. It looks like there's some binary data. When you're seeing, if, you, if you're printing out some contents of a file or memory and you see 
patterns that look like this, that means that you're dealing with binary patterns or memory addresses or something that really isn't meant to be interpreted as ASCII. But notice that when we do get to, okay, here, x86, 64, for some reason, the string of our computer system's architecture is there. That's Intel x86, 64 bits. But the important part is right here, right? Notice dot slash adventure, and there's no space, wildlings, giants, foo, barbaz. These are the arguments we started our process with, right? Dot slash adventure was the name of the binary. Wildlings, giants, foo, barbaz were the next arguments. When C, remember, strings are terminated with the null character. And the null character is what we call a zero width string when we try and print it to your, to your terminal. It doesn't show up as anything. You can't see the null character when it's printed. So why don't we actually um, just modify this a little bit and convince ourselves that in fact, there is a null, car uh, null terminating character here. So I'm gonna go ahead and edit my adventure.c file one more time. And I'm gonna test if the character pointed to by hero is equal to the null or the null character, then I'm going to put a new line. All right. Else, I'm going to uh, put out the character. And so this will, instead of printing a, an empty zero width character, which is the uh, null terminating character, we're gonna print out a new line. So let's try recompiling this and seeing if it works. So we recompile. We run this again, and wow, it looks like there's actually more interpretable output here. There must have been a lot of null terminating characters in what we saw. And these sure look like our environment variables, right? So previously we had set up, I had set up a, an environment variable for my git author name so that when I made a new commit in git, this was the author name that it established by default. And we, I set that up as, a, as an environment variable. And we'll talk more about environment variables in just a moment. But we keep scrolling and above the environment variables, there are our arguments that we began our process with. So it looks like in this space above our call stack, there must be some of the data that our program was started with in order to get us into the process. Here are the arguments our process began with, and here are the environment variables. And so there must be a good way, a better way than what we're doing, because this is sort of hacky, right? Um, it, to get access to this data. And this would allow us to write programs that give us access to command line arguments when our process is begun. So let's take a look at that. Uh, so as we just saw, this space above the call stack is populated with C strings, which include our arguments and our environment variables. And when we think about what are our arguments, well, when you run a program in the shell, notice you're just typing a string. And what the shell is doing is it's taking that string and trying to give some meaning to it. It's trying to derive uh, the command that you were intending to run based on your inputs. And what it will do is it'll break that string up into what we call tokens, which you can think of as C strings that are just semantic units in what's uh, in the command that's being formed. So the first C string would be the dot slash args and it ends in a, a null terminating character. This is our first argument. Uh, and that's always true by convention. When you begin a process, the first argument in your argument values is the path to the process that the process was begun with. And then we see it index one, uh, or, or there's there's no indices yet, but if we think about the tokens here, uh, the next token is the string A, the string big, and cake. And then inside uh, our, our program, the operating system is gonna set up an array that refers to each of these strings. And the way that it does that is with an array of pointers, which we looked at in the previous video. So we're gonna have an array of pointers that's called argv, that's short for argument values. And each of those pointers is gonna point subsequently to the tokens of our command that made up uh, the, the, the request we made to the operating system to begin this process, right? So argv is also conventionally a null terminated array of pointers. Uh, and the reason for that is so that you can either iterate through them and, and look for that sentinel, which says here's the end of your pointers, uh, or we'll see that there's a way that we get access to the number of arguments that our program was begun with in the main function as well. So the shell, once it has these argument values set up, it says, hey, operating system, I want you to go begin a process. Here are my argument values. And the operating system then uh, does some magical work to go find this process, looks through your path uh, to look for the, the 
where is the binary program or the script that you're trying to start up and then goes and sets up another process, right? It copies those values into the new processes uh, memory space right above where the call stack begins as part of the, um, the sequence of steps that happens before a process is begun or as it's, as it's spinning up, right? So that's what we're seeing explained here. Uh, and it just goes ahead and sets this value up and then it's about to set up the call to main just below that, right? And so this is how we're gonna gain access to command line arguments. The way that the, uh, by conven conventionally with the C operating system, with the C programming language, it's going to, uh, in its main function, have two parameters set up automatically and have those parameters populated with arguments from the operating system. The first parameter is gonna be int arg c, and this will be the count of our number of arguments. And then arg v is going to be a, an array of pointers to characters, right? And so this is our array of pointers to character arrays or array of pointers to C strings, right? And so that's what argv is going to be. So why don't we go ahead and try uh, setting up a, a program to give us an example of this. And I'm gonna show you two ways that we can do this. So notice in this example, there's a pointer to a pointer to characters, that's our argv. Uh, that's one way of doing this. And, and in my code listing in the terminal, I'm gonna show you another way. And I'm gonna encourage you to try both to convince yourself that they mean the same thing. All right, so I'm gonna open up args, let's see. And notice in this example, I've got an array of pointers to characters or an array of pointers to C strings. That's no different from having a pointer to a pointer uh, to characters at a conceptual level. Each of them is used conventionally uh, to have an array of pointers to see strings. It just depends on how you wanna work with this uh, data. And here I'm working with, I, I'm, I'm reading each of these values using indexing notation and index i to go through and read and print off each of the arguments that our program has begun with. So again, argc will tell us the number of arguments that's gonna include the name of the program that we started this with. Uh, as well as any arguments that we gave it. And this is just a for loop to loop through each of those arguments and print them out to our uh, standard output. So I'm going to compile this program. And if you wanna go back and pause the video and complete it, I would encourage you to. And so I'm just, I'm in a very lazy way, I'm not gonna use the warnings or anything like that. We're just uh, compiling this straight up and a dot out. And if I begin this with just a dot out, it prints a dot out, which was our first argument value. That was uh, the name of the process, the name of the uh, executable that began the process. And then a dot out, and we could have some other arguments as well, foo, bar, baz, wildlings, right? And so notice that each of those values that we iterated through, each of those values that came in as an argument, we can now use to write command line programs which behave differently based on the arguments their process has begun with. And you've already been using it, many different command line programs, um, such as CP for copying files between two places, Maker for making a directory, um, grep for searching based on a textual pattern. Most useful command, get, all of get's commands have many uh, arguments that are associated with it. Most useful command line programs are gonna make use of arguments in order to drive their behavior, to, to act as inputs or, or pieces of information in order to control what it is they actually do. And so now with argc and argv, as we're seeing here, we add these two parameters to our main function and you can write command line applications that take in inputs in, form, in the form of arguments, right? This is actually a really powerful thing to be able to do. Right. So you could also try rewriting this example to use pointer uh, dereferencing instead of uh, array index notation, and that's a good exercise for practicing and convincing yourself that uh, this is just syntactical sugar for dereferencing array, or sorry, pointer arithmetic. One of the things that I have to tell you, because you've spent a lot of time writing Java at this point, I imagine, uh, is that Java's main method, you've written this main method many times over, right? public static void main string array args. And you've probably 
unless you've written Java to run at a command line, you probably haven't thought too much about what is that string array args. Well, it's exactly the same array of like C string values that we're talking about in C. You can uh, write Java programs to run at the command line and it would read in arguments that you give the Java program, just like we've made, uh, we've been demonstrating with C programs. You can do the same in Java. And this is how you write command line interface Java applications that have arguments. You make use of that string array uh, that the main method in your Java programs has. So they're the exact same concept um, because of the way Java works with a Java virtual machine needing to in, um, compile your program on the fly uh, using just-in-time compiling techniques. It's gonna have a little bit more machinery to get from the C string uh, array of values uh, and pointers into your Java program. There's some extra steps that the, the JVM, the Java virtual machine has to take, but it began as the exact same set of data in the same place in the processes state. Uh, and then the JVM just uh, needed to translate that into Java strings for you for this to work out. Every general purpose programming language or scripting language has the ability to read command line arguments in one way or another. Uh, and so if you just search for whatever, if you're trying to write a programming, a CLI program in Python or in JavaScript, you just search for how do I access my command line args or arguments, and you'll find examples uh, for how you would do this in any other language as well. So let's talk briefly about environment variables. Uh, and these are, you can think of them kind of like global variables to a shell session. And they're useful for knowing some things about your environment or some contextual information. One of the most important uh, environment variables is what is your working directory? What is the directory your shell is in when you began a process? And programs will wind up using this to look for related files in that directory, right? And so this will impact the way a program behaves because it's when you begin, say, the copy program or you begin Git, uh, when your working directory is, is it, your working directory is providing the context to make those commands meaningful, right? They're running uh, in some specific directory and the way that it, any program that you write knows, well, what directory are we talking about is an environment variable. And in this case, the PWV variable is the, uh, the conventional one in, in Unix operating systems to read that, right? So you can access these variables from the shell. Uh, we could, do this example here. So the way that you reference a, a, an environment variable, echo, and then I'm gonna use this funky syntax for reading my variable, pwd, uh, inside. So the dollar sign is saying access a variable, and then we're using a special uh, conventional um, technique for, for reading our variable, which we'll look at when we look at shell scripting later on in this course uh, with, more direct, with more specificity. And notice we're reading that variable and then uh, echo is just printing out the contents of it. Right. So again, the purpose of these is to provide some context to your programs as you run them. When you've set up a git author name or a git email, whenever you run git, it can read your environment variables and know, oh, okay, uh, I'm gonna use as sort of a configuration setting, this author and this email when forming the commit and signing who it should be attributed to. When you're working on programs that are uh, deployed to servers and are common in industry server-side applications, you'll see that a, a technique that's widely used is certain configuration settings will be read in from environment variables. And this allows you to write programs that don't have hard-coded dependencies on certain strings. Like if you have uh, some API key, which you can think of almost like as a password to some service. So if you if you wanted to be able to access, you know, Amazon's images service uh, and, and upload images to Amazon from your server program, uh, you wouldn't want to hard code in your key to be able to do that. You would want to set that up potentially as an environment variable so that um, you could have a separate key for when you're testing locally on your machine versus a, a key that's that's the one you would want to use when you're when you're running in production. Uh, for your company or something like that. And so you'll have different keys for different um, modes that you might run a program. Uh, things like which mode is your is your server running in at all would be an environment variable. So lots of things that your program would treat as configuration 
are commonly read in as environment variables rather than hard coded in or rather than uh, inventing a lot of machinery to have configuration files separate from environment variables. So later on in this course, we'll look at this idea in more depth. Uh, it's a little bit beyond where we're at right now. What I just want to mention is that just like we can read our argument, our argument values, which is uh, an array of pointers to C strings, we can get an array of pointers to C strings, which are our environment variables, right? Uh, and uh, you'll see that that's possible in, and you can try running this program to explore your environment variables in a very similar way. The print env utility uh, will print out all of your environment variables and uh, you can print specific ones if you want. And this is useful for inspecting what are the, the variables that are associated with your current sh shell session. So if I do print env, notice that all of those values, many of them, all of them uh, were printed out before, but this is actually done in a way that is kosher and isn't leading to a seg fault like we were when we were exploring memory uh, sort of haphazardly. So this is a quick introduction to how you access and how you think about where in your processes memory, uh, the arguments that a process was to begin with and the environment variables that a process was to begin with actually reside. You can use this to write command line interface applications, which are driven by user inputs in the form of, of command line flags and arguments, and also by configuration or, or system settings to know like what is the current working directory this program was run from, uh, in other system configuration or, or, or user specific needs, such as our git author and email. Great work.